Welcome to the wood turning workshop. Sooner or later, the stork is going to pay a visit to you or someone special in your life, and we want to commemorate that event by making a nice gift. So today, we're going to be making a baby rattle. Stay tuned. Before we get started today making our rattle, we have to talk about safety. If you're going to make something for an infant or a child, you have to be concerned about choking hazards. And there are very specific regulations on toys for children. And when it comes to rattles, they have their own set of guidelines. To find out the specific requirements for rattles, you can visit the U.S. Consumer Product Safety Commission by going to www.cpsc.gov or you can contact them by calling 301 504-0608. You're looking for requirements for rattles 16 CFR part 1510. Now let's take a closer look at the rattle we're going to be making today. In researching this I ran across a lot of rattles that only had a ball on one end. You have to consider the handle is also a choking hazard so our design is going to have a ball on both ends. I'm using maple and purple heart because these woods hold up to a lot of wear and tear very well. So let's get started. We're going to make the ends of the rattle first. I have a piece of maple that's five inches long and two inches square. It has to be at least two inches square because the measurement for the end of the rattle, the minimum size it can be is 1.68 inches. And to be on the safe side, I'm going to make mine about one and three quarter inches. Now you can take a square blank like this and mount it in your chuck. You put it in at an angle and then tighten it down. One important thing is to make sure that the bottom of the blank is square, that way this runs true. I'm going to bring our tool rest up. I've got the height of it set at about center on the piece. We're going to line the tool rest up in line with the bed of the lathe so we have a straight line. Rotate this by hand, make sure nothing's touching. Get my safety glasses on. Grab my roughing gouge. Make sure that the lathe is turned down to a slow speed. Start it up. Everything's good. Increase the speed up. Start with light cuts and work your way towards the end of the blank. Never come back towards the chuck. You could get a nasty catch that way. If this piece were much longer than five inches, I'd probably bring the tailstock up for extra support while I'm roughing out, but at this length, I really don't need it. Okay, let's see how we're doing. Almost roughed out, and I want to leave it that way. If I go and try and make a perfect cylinder, I could take it down too far and make it too small and ruin the whole piece. So I'm going to take my spindle gouge. We're going to move the tool rest a little bit closer. Make sure it rotates freely. And now we're going to start cutting the ball on the end. To start to cut, rub the bevel of the spindle gouge and then roll it over. All we're doing is making a bead. As I like to say, you sneak up on a bead. Just take a little bit of wood off each time. On your last pass, make sure that you leave a tiny dimple in the center of the wood. Now that we've gotten this far, we have to do a little bit of measuring. And to make it easier, I made myself a template. This is one and seven eighths of an inch wide, just a bit more than one and three quarter inches. That way when I'm sanding, I have a little bit of room to play with. Once this starts to fit over, I know I'm at the right diameter. The other nice thing is, if I line it up this way, 
I now know how far to make the other half of the ball. Take your pencil, line it up with the mark, start the lathe, press in. There, now we can see the mark better. Now, take your spindle gouge and start cutting in from the right. Couple passes. Then go back to the left and come in a couple passes. You have to clear the wood out to the left in order to be able to make the ball to the right. Now we want to start sanding and work our way from about 150 grit through 320. The reason I'm sanding now is because if I sand after I hollow the ball out, there's a chance I could crack the wood from heat buildup. Right now, there's less of a chance. So I just want to keep the paper moving and touch it lightly to the wood. To make it easier to hollow the ball out, we're going to drill a hole. I've got a Jacobs chuck, which is simply a drill bit holder with a Morse taper that fits into your tailstock. I've put in a half inch drill bit. You can see the tape right here. That measures the depth I want to drill. And I took my diameter sizing gauge, held it up there, and left about a quarter of an inch to play with. That way I won't go through the top of the ball. So we take the Jacobs chuck, slide it into the tailstock, bring it up closely, lock the tailstock in. Start the lathe up and make sure you keep the speed low to prevent heat buildup. Remember that dimple we left? Well, that's going to help center the drill bit. Now, don't drill this all the way through in one shot because the wood chips will cause the drill bit to bind and that will also create heat. So make sure that you just drill a little bit, bring the drill bit back out so the chips can clear, then go back in and repeat until you're done. Before we get started hollowing, I want to show you the technique we're going to use today. And it's impossible to see inside the piece of wood, so what we did is we've made a blank with a window. So now you can actually see inside, you can see the hole we drilled, and once it starts spinning, you're going to be able to see the tool movement as we're cutting. And the tool we're going to be using is a small curved scraper. When you use this tool, make sure that you rest the straight part of the shaft on the tool rest, not the curved part. If you rest the curved part, it's going to want to turn on you. If it's on the straight part, you'll have good balance and good support. The other thing is make sure that the tool rest is up a little bit to where the tip is just slightly above center, because when you raise this tip up is when the cutting starts. Let's see how this works. The first cut I make establishes the thickness of the wall of the ball. I make a plunge cut. Then I can bring the tool back out, feel for that shelf, and make another cut. I work my way down in steps. I'm not hollowing the ball to finish thickness right off the bat. If the tool stops cutting, just slightly rotate the tip up, and that's when it will engage. So to be safe, rotate the tip down, it won't cut. Rotate the tip up, and it does cut. If this was a normal ball, you'd have to stop occasionally and use compressed air to clear out the chips. Now you might notice the tool's not cutting very well, and well that's because it's a scraper. Their edges don't last very long. But this tool is special. Rather than take it to the grinder to get a new edge on it, we have to do something different. If you look at this scraper, it has a very specific design behind it. It's a round piece of steel that curves, and then this is flattened off, and that's the cutting edge. 
it's one piece. If you notice, this shaft is perfectly in line with the tip. If I was to take this to the grinder like I normally do and start grinding away at the tip, I would shorten the tip. That would be bad because I'd run out of cutting steel to begin with. But the other thing is, I'd be moving the tip further and further back. It would not be in line with the shaft anymore, which would cause instability when I started turning. It would be very hard to hold this steady. What I have to do is take a diamond file, and with that diamond file, I lay it flat on the blade and go across. I have to make very sure that I'm doing a very, very flat movement here because I don't want to round off the edges. Now, that won't leave a burr. If you do want one, take your file and lightly dress the sides by pushing and stroking upwards. That will raise a burr. It won't last very long, but it will make a very nice clean cut. But you can still cut with just the sharp edge. There, that's cutting much better. I'll just take light cuts to finish up the bottom, then go back up to the top. Again, it's like a plunge cut. We make a shell. And that shell helps us find the next cut. And then that shell helps us find the next cut. And we just work our way all the way down to the bottom, nibbling a little bit at a time. Now when you think you have the wall about the way you want it, you can pull the tool back and forth and clean up the inside of the ball. Now leave a nice smooth finish. When you're hollowing something like this, it's always safer to stop the lathe before you remove the tool. It'll prevent a catch. Now this looks a little bit messy, and that's because I only had half the ball there, so some of the wood tore out, but you get the idea. So what I want to do now is remount my other piece of work and start hollowing it. Okay, now we really are blind, but it only takes a little bit of practice and a little bit of faith to be able to hollow something like this. I'm making sure that my first plunge cut, which establishes the depth of the wall, is just the way I want it. Now, I can start working my way in, nibbling a little bit of wood at a time. And you can see things are going much faster than before in the demonstration, and that's because with the entire ball there, I have support for the tool through the entire cut. Like any other wood turning cut, make sure you move your body with the tool. And that's very true with a scraper. You can see I'm really working hard to control the handle, because the wood is constantly wanting to pull the tip of the tool down. Don't forget to clear the chips every now and then. That'll make it a lot easier to keep cutting. Yeah, that sounds about right. This is so small, it's a little bit hard to get a caliper in there to judge the wall thickness. So if you go by sound, if the sound sounds the same, your thickness is about the same. So the next thing we want to do is we're going to part this off. So we're going to swing the tool rest around, put it about mid-height on there. We're going to take our spindle gouge, and we're going to start parting the ball off. Now we have a second ball right here that we're going to have to turn, so we don't want to take too much wood off while we're doing this. So as always, just take light cuts and just shape the bead a little bit at a time. Work your way on both sides until you almost have all the wood gone.
Now that's as far as I can go with the spindle gouge. So I'm going to grab my parting tool to finish up. Make sure you don't part off flush against the ball. That could result in torn grain. Leave a little bit of extra wood and we'll take care of that later. Now before we can finish this up, we have to turn the second ball and it's the same procedure as before. Start with your spindle gouge. Great. Now we've got that parted off, but yet we have to clean up the ends of the balls. And the way we're going to do that is by turning a jam fit tenon with the piece of wood we have left in the chuck. The first thing we want to do is to take our ball and with our calipers get the inside diameter of that hole. And now we'll use this for the measurement of our tenon. Start the lathe up and get your parting tool and start making your cut. with the calipers, bring them up, there we go. Now we'll stop it and see how the fit is. Oh, that's really nice. Got it right off the bat. Now, even though that is a great fit, I want to just be a little bit safer and take one more precaution and put a little bit of masking tape on here to hold the ball in place while I'm sanding. That way it won't come popping off. And since I have so much wood to remove, I'm going to start with a lower grit sandpaper, 100 grit, to remove the wood quickly. Now, we're ready for the easy part. We're going to turn the handle. I have a 6 inch long, one inch square piece of purple heart. I've got it mounted with the drive center on the headstock side and a live center on the tailstock side. And if you notice, the diameter of this live center is fairly narrow. That way I can get my tool rest up closer to the piece of work. So we're going to take a roughing gouge, start the lathe up, and make this into a smooth cylinder. Start working towards the end and work your way back incrementally, removing a little bit of wood at a time. Now to rough out the left side, I'm going to just reverse what I was doing and work my way towards that end. Now starting at the left, take a long, slow pass, taking a little bit of wood off, and do that a couple times and you'll wind up with a nice cylinder. There, that's nice. Now, if you think about it, an infant's hand is probably no larger than three fingers. So to get a measurement for the handle, I'm going to put my hand down here and make a mark about a quarter inch on each side. And so that will be the length of my handle. And I'll take my spindle gouge and start dishing out and reducing the wood on here so the handle's not too thick either for the child. The shape I'm making is a gentle cove. I'm going to work my way towards the center from the right side, come back to the left, I'm just going to keep dishing this out until I get the handle down to about a half inch in diameter.
If you start to pick up a little bit of vibration or chatter, you can hold the tool in your right hand, bring your fingers around the wood and lightly support it as you push in with the tool. You're not pushing hard, you're just taking a light cut and what your fingers do is they stop all the chatter and you get a smooth surface. Now we need to turn the tenons that are going to fit into the ball. So we're going to take our calipers, get the inside diameter of the ball, tighten that down, use our parting tool, and reduce the diameter to the size of the tenon. Now do the same thing on the other end. Now, where the handle fits into the hole on the ball, I want that part of the handle to follow the curve of the ball. So I have to bevel it in slightly, and I'm using my skew chisel to do that. And repeat on the other end. And now we're going to touch the handle up with just a little bit of sandpaper. Now a quick trip to the bandsaw to cut the tenons down to size. Now we're ready for the fun part, putting this thing together. Normally I'd put a dried bean in there, but I couldn't find any around the house today. So I'm using some of my wife's coffee beans. Peppermint flavored. Should smell good. So you want to put those in there, put the piece together, and test the rattle. And that sounds pretty good. So we'll put the same number in this end. And now we have to consider how we're going to put this together. We want to glue this together with something that is very strong and will hold very well. So we're going to use a polyurethane glue to do that. So let's take the ends off. And with polyurethane glue, you get the best bond if you wet the wood. So we'll take a little bit of water, wet the ends here on the tenon, and we're going to wet the inside right there on the holes of the balls. Now, you don't want to touch polyurethane glue with your hands. So get a stick and put a very light coat on the tenon. Polyurethane glue expands as it dries. So if you put too much on there, it'll expand inside the ball and the rattle won't work anymore. So I've got just a slight light coat on there. Gonna put this in. Okay, that's on there nice. We'll put a little more glue on this end. Take the ball, put it on, twist the ball a bit, and that will distribute the glue on the tenon. And then take a clamp and lightly hold it there for about 30 minutes before you do anything else. Then you can take a safe finish, like mineral oil, and put it on the rattle, and then finish it off with some beeswax. It gives it a really nice look. Well, this was a lot of fun, and I hope you enjoyed today's project. So until the next time on the Wood Turning Workshop, keep turning. Mm -hmm.